Can you hear me? Yeah, wait, 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 just a sec. Yeah, okay. So everybody, yes, ready for the quiz? Yes. So every, everybody be active and try to answer as many questions as possible. Write the question in the chat box. I'll be seeing your chat and yes. Um, uh, please remember everybody, this is just a practice, okay? And uh, yes, uh, just before the exam, do look for my tentative questions which might come in the exam. But uh, the important point here is that uh, try to attempt as many questions as possible. Treat it as your uh, basically just like your exam, okay? So question number one on the screen, identify the technique, okay? Just a second, yeah. Okay. So identify the technique here. What do you think is this technique? Which instrument is shown here? Which instrument is shown here, guys? So please remember, guys, see when the red cell is passing through the electrodes, you can see that a wave is coming here. Okay, so you can see a wave is coming here. This is a principle of blood cell counter. Okay, so this is what is the principle of red blood cell counter. Okay, so this is how we do the blood cell counting. Okay, that's the principle of red cell counting. So please remember whenever uh, we are using blood cell counters, this is the most important instrument. Okay, so remember height of the pulse is equal to the volume of the cells and the number of pulses is equal uh, number of time the pulses are coming that is equal to the number of cells okay and uh, when we arrange these oscillations we get a graph like this and therefore we get a histogram so please remember this is a blood cell counter everybody should be very very clear with this this is a blood cell counter okay you should not get confused with it this is a blood cell counter and uh, and that's how we count the cells. Everybody clear with this? Yes. So do not forget this instrument, guys. This is a very important instrument. It is a blood cell counter. Okay. Now, once we are clear with this, let's go to the next uh, question here. So what is this instrument? What is this instrument that is shown? Okay, because these are instruments. I have not given the option. So you have to tell me what is this instrument that is shown here? Quick guys, I'm I'm waiting for your answer. Very good, Santosh and Shashwat. You're the first ones to answer. Yes, this is a flow cytometry. Good moonlight. So remember, whenever the cells pass in one flow, single flow, what happens is the light falls on it and the light gets scattered in two directions. Forward scatter is always equivalent to the size and side scatter is always equivalent to the granularity. Okay, so side scatter is always equivalent to the granularity. So more the granularity, more the side scatter and more the size, more the forward scatter. So please remember this was the question which came in the exam. So which is the test which can be used for finding number and type of immune cells. Okay, so always remember the test that can be used for num finding the number and type of immune cell is your flow cytometry. What does this mean? What does this mean is that whenever the cells are going like in one flow, in a single flow, that's very, very important. Okay, this is called isoelectric focusing. It goes in a single flow, single line. The light falls on it and the light should fall on the one particle only and then it gets scattered in two directions. Okay, so this is what is called hydrodynamic focusing. That is single file passing of the cell and hydrodynamic focusing. And remember, whenever we see the graphs we can see the graphs in two patterns either they come like this this is what is called as dot plot this is called as dot and plot so either the flow cytometry plot can be given as dot plot or they can come as histograms so either they can come as histograms or they can come as dot plot and this was also a question that can be uh, that was asked okay so remember dot plot and histograms are very very important patterns by which flow cytometric patterns can be seen okay 
so that is uh, how we can quantitate the number of the cells okay so that is what you have to remember now most important marker that we use in flow cytometry is cd45 which is also called as leukocyte common antigen and uh, with side scatter when you plot it you get a direction you get a plot like this remember cd45 bright cells and with very low side scatter are lymphocytes so these are lymphocytes okay whereas cells with very high side scatter and CD45 brightly positive are your granulocytes, okay? And these cells here, pink cells here are monocytes, okay? So these are monocytes which are intermediate between these two cells. And question that they can ask you is this, remember this green graph, which is green cell population, which is shown here, which is CD45 dim because it is on the lower side of CD45. These are blasts. So this is what is called as blast gate, okay? So they can ask you that what are what is this green population? population which is shown here everybody should remember this is a blast population which is seen here this is a blast gate okay right so once everybody is clear with this okay so that is that is the uh, classical point that you have to remember now next uh, uh, as you all know that all the acute myeloid leukemias can be diagnosed by flow cytometry however there is an exception to the rule which acute myeloid leukemia the diagnosis of choice is not flow cytometry. Remember, it is acute promyelocytic leukemia. So in acute promyelocytic leukemia, the diagnosis of choice is not flow cytometry. It is fish. You have to see the translocation that is PML RARA translocation. Okay, so that is PML promyelocytic leukemia retinoic acid receptor that is 15 17 translocation you have to document it by fish okay why so because if you do a, a flow cytometry in apml you get a very typical pattern which is a teardrop pattern but because they are not blast they are promyelocytes abnormal promyelocytes so they are cd34 negative and hladr negative so that is what you should remember so, which acute myeloid leukemias are CD34 and HLADR negative? It is APML, you have to remember. But if somebody asks you which acute leukemia gives you teardrop pattern on the flow cytometry, it is APML. That is what you have to remember. Okay. So, remember the diagnosis of choice for APML is always fish. Okay. And you have to document 1517 translocation in this. Okay. I'm going to the next question, guys. Okay. So, uh, this everybody knows, I'm sure this has been asked so many times at various forums. And uh, what is this graph showing you? So, just to explain once for all for everybody, remember when we using CD19, CD19 brightly positive cells are B lymphocytes. Okay, and then we use CD40 to see whether these B lymphocytes, which are CD19 positive, are expressing CD40 or not. So, yes. They are expressing CD40 here because the cell population is coming on this quadrant. That means these are normal B lymphocytes, which are CD40 positive. So this is normal person. Look at the second graph here. So these are again B lymphocytes here, which are CD19 positive. But you can see that these B lymphocytes are not having CD40 here. So they are absent for CD40. So remember absence of CD40 on the B cells or absence of CD40 ligand on the T cell. This is identified by CD154. This is very, very classical of, what is it? Hyper IgM syndrome. Okay, so this is hyper IgM syndrome. Very good, Janni. Perfectly answered. Good. So that's the graph of hyper IgM syndrome. Okay, now let's go to the next. Who can answer this question? So this is a six month old child with recurrent pneumonia and the flow cytometry was done. Which test would you like to do next? Okay, so this patient has recurrent pneumonia. So what uh, what is this child having? So when you put the markers here for CD19 and CD20, you see that there are no B lymphocytes. Okay, so there is neither CD20 positive cells, neither there are CD19 positive cells. So that means this is a case of Bruton hyper uh, hypogamma globinemia. So this is a gamma globinemia basically. So this is a gamma globinemia because you can't see any any B cells. So this is Bruton okay, a gamma globinemia and the mutation here is BTK. Perfect guys, very good. Okay. Okay, next question that they can ask you here is everybody can you answer this question? Uh, so what are the cells? See first. 
point you should remember here is the, is the log scale. So whenever we are using log scales on the flow cytometry, that means we are going to see the cells which is very smaller. So RBCs and platelets are the cells which we see on the log scale. So these are your RBCs and the cells just smaller than RBCs are your platelets. So these are your platelets. Okay. So we are getting here the platelets and what are we seeing? So normally if I have to see the platelet antigens, we know we have GP1B. Okay. A GP2B and GP3A. Okay. So these are the antigens which we have to identify. So everybody knows that GP1B is identified by CD42. GP2B is identified yes by 41 and uh, 3A by 61. So once we see that any platelet is negative for 41 and 61, that is there is absence of GP2B3A, which is very, very classical of Glanzmann thrombosthenia. You can see that the platelets are nicely expressing CD42B. That is GP1B is present. Okay. So this is very classical case of Glanzmann's thromboasthenia, which you should be very clear with. Okay. Okay. So next question, which group of cells are identified on flow cytometry, which are FOXP3 positive and CD25 positive? Okay. Very good. So this, when you see this FOXP3 and uh, uh, CD25 positive, this is regulatory T cells, guys, which you all have to remember. This is classical regulatory T cells, which is FOXP3 positive. And who will tell me if there is absence of FOXP3, what is the disease? Absence of FOXP3 produces a disease which is called as IPEX. Very good. Okay. So this is IPEX. Okay. So that is very, very classical, which everybody should remember. Okay. So this is a polyendocrinopathy, immunodeficiency, entropathy, which is X-linked disease. Okay. So that is IPEX, which is due to absence of regulatory T cells. Okay. And remember, regulatory T cells are immunosuppressive cells. They suppress the immunity. Okay. Right, guys, look at this now. So again, this is a 55-year-old male uh, which presents with uh, pancytopenia. Also, he has calf pain. That is, he has DVT, his well score. Well score is the scoring for DVT. Okay, it's 7. So he has DVT and pancytopenia. So whenever you have pancytopenia with thrombosis, you should always think of PNH. Okay, so this is important in the case of history also, which I'm giving you. And uh, PNH is always diagnosed on flow cytometry. Nowadays, we are using flare. Okay, so what is flare? Fluorescent aerolysin. That is what we are using nowadays. But in case, this case, if you see, CD55 and 59 are absent here. Even if one person cells are negative for 55 and 59, then you have to diagnose this as PNH. Okay, so this is very classical PNH. Very good. Next PG trivia. Perfect. You are the first one to answer. So this is your PNH, okay? Yes, Chandni, HAMS test can also be done in this, but it is a very old test, okay? So who will tell me which is the other condition where HAMS test will be positive apart from PNH? Okay, it is CDA, okay, congenital dyserythropoietic anemia. And please remember, uh, yesterday in um, uh, NEAT PG uh, SS hematology, there was a question that what is the gene mutation for CDA2? It is basically SEC20, uh, yes, yes, very good, SEC23B. So that is uh, uh, for congenital dyserythropoietic anemia. So remember both. Uh, uh, both PNH and uh, CDA are positive for HAMS test, okay. Now, let's go to the next question. First, let me ask you the question and then let me explain you. This is a repeat question from INICT 2020 in which the question was asked that prographism and long hands and feet were seen. What is the mutation which is associated in this case? So, who will tell me this? Okay, so who will tell me the answer to this? So what is the mutation which is involved in this? So prognathism and long hand and feet, you know that this is probably a somatotrophic adenoma. Okay, so let us understand this first. To understand this, I'll take you to the pituitary gland. And remember, this is very uh, poorly read topic. So I'm, I just want you to explain the, you want, I want you to know this. Okay, so remember, we have two types of uh, pituitary cells, Okay. So whenever I'm talking about adenohypophysis, I have color loving cells and color healers. Okay. So color loving cells are called chromophyll. Okay. 
so chromophiles are basically two type of color loving pink lovers and blue lovers okay so whenever i'm talking about pink lovers pink lovers are basically two okay that is somatotrophs and mammotrophs so growth hormone and prolactin are both pink lovers okay so growth and prolactin are pink lovers whereas blue lovers basically when you look at that that is uh, your thyrotrophs gonadotrophs and corticotrophs so, so T G C okay is basically your basophils blue lovers okay thyroid gonadotroph and corticotrophs okay so remember now what happens is they have their own different transcription factor okay so remember you know uh, growth and prolactin are girls so they are pink lovers so pink lovers are girls so they are growth and prolactin okay so they are girls so thyrotroph is boy blue lover but he follows the girls okay so this thyrotrophs comes with growth and prolactin and all three fall in a pit okay so this is pit one so pit one is a growth factor for growth prolactin and thyroid so they all fall in the pit okay so whereas yeah thyrotrophs are are stalkers okay so they are always stalkers and all of them fall together in a love pit you can say like that okay whereas corticotroph when you're saying they're very brainy people okay so they like produce acth they're brainiers okay so they will say no no we will not fall in pit we are t pits so they will fo not fall into pit so they are t pit t pit is corticotrophs okay and gonadotroph is a different world gynae is a world all together different world all together so fsh and lh are gonadotroph and they have a different transcription factor that is sf1 and gata2 sf1 and gata2 is a transcription factor for gonadotrophs okay so they are very different and they have basically your sf1 and gata2 so remember then when they are asked now they can ask you anything okay so they can ask you anything so if they ask you growth prolactin and thyroid it is pit one if they are asking you corticotroph adenoma you know it is t pit and gonadotroph is a different world altogether so it will have sf1 and gata2 so that is what you have to remember please remember here one more catch point here there is a syndrome called as emberger syndrome which occurred due to gata2 deficiency okay so gata2 deficiency is basically emberger syndrome and gata1 where do you see gata1 down syndromes okay so gata1 mutation is seen in down syndrome okay so remember these points always okay guys so now let's go to the next question okay so uh, this is a googly question but you should not do this wrong so a female is presenting with rash fever joint pain and chest pain and there are medium sized vegetation on both the sides of the wall what is the probable cause of it anybody who can tell me this so vegetations is one thing which they uh, always ask you so everybody should be super clear with this <laughs> okay so when we talk about the vegetations remember guys the small warty projections on the closing line is always a rheumatic heart disease okay very good very good gk and couple you are first to answer okay and uh, again if you say medium sized vegetations which are along the closing line it is nbt non bacterial thrombotic endocarditis is basically due to hypercoagulability so any condition where which produces hypercoagulability can cause nbt and such endocarditis are also called as marantic endocarditis if it occurs due to cancers okay whereas infective endocarditis when we say it is a very large vegetation which destroy the walls so this destroys the wall and even extend to the papillary muscles so that is the classical feature of infective endocarditis apart from that remember limb and sac endocarditis is a vegetation which can occur on both the side of the wall and can also occur in the pockets pockets formed by the wall when the ventricles okay that is limb and sac endocarditis which can be seen in sle so that's another question okay next question is match the following guys so you have to quickly match and tell me the answer so you have 2 seconds to answer this question everybody so a myeloidosis is one of the most important question that can come in exam and you have to know this super well okay quickly quickly so hemodialysis has which type of amyloid quickly so it is 
a beta 2 microglobulin so remember beta 2 microglobulin is a part of mhc1 it is a large mhc molecule it cannot pass through the fistula so it gets blocked there and such patients will present with carpal tunnel syndrome okay such patients will present with carpal tunnel syndrome familial mediterranean fever will have aa amyloidosis systemic senile amyloidosis this is systemic senile everybody is going to get senile old so such patient will have normal attr please remember familial amyloid neuropathies have mutated attr okay isolated atrial amyloidosis is because of atrial natriuretic factor and endocrine is because of iapp okay so that is the typical match the following and which everybody should be super clear okay <coughs> right guys very good okay so this is the chart which everybody should remember okay so uh, now some questions in amyloid which can be asked remember everybody the typical point here that you should remember here is that amyloid is made up of 95 percent fibrillary protein which changes with the type of amyloid however five percent is serum amyloid peep component which is constant it doesn't changes glycosaminoglycan react with iodine okay it reacts with iodine okay so that's the composition of amyloid which everybody should be super super clear okay now once you're clear with this, next thing you have to remember is that when I talk about myeloid, we have primary and secondary myeloid. Primary myeloid is AL myeloid. It occurs in multiple myeloma where there is a lot of immunoglobulin which is produced along with a lot of light chains. So whenever these light chains deposit, this is A lambda, uh, A light chain. And most of the most of the time, these light chains are lambda more than kappa. Okay, so most of the time these light chains are lambda more than kappa. If I talk about secondary myelodosis, this is AA. And remember, the most important interleukin here is interleukin 6. And in majority of the secondary myelodosis, we have uh, AA amyloid. And remember, familial Mediterranean fever also has AA amyloid that you have to remember. So remember, all the reactive conditions which can cause amyloidosis, you can remember it as Botry. Okay, so bronchiectasis, osteomyelitis, ankylosing spondylitis, TB, rheumatoid arthritis, and inflammatory bowel disease. Apart from that, renal cell carcinoma and Hodgkin's lymphoma are two cancers which can present with reactive amyloidosis, okay, secondary amyloidosis. Remember, rheumatoid arthritis is most important condition with secondary amyloidosis, okay. So, two betas that you have to remember, one is a beta, which is deposited in the brain of Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease. Remember, all the patients of Down syndrome after the age of 40 will develop which disease? Alzheimer's disease, okay? And in hemodialysis, we have just now told it is beta 2 microglobulin, which is a part of MHC1 and, and it causes carpal tunnel syndrome, okay? Now... ATTR, I told you, normal ATTR is deposited in systemic senile amyloidosis and mutated ATTR is deposited in familial amyloid neuropathies, okay? Also, you remember which cancers can present with amyloid apart from renal cell carcinoma and Hodgkin's, which shows reactive. Amyloid types are specially present, okay? So, if I'm talking about medullary carcinoma of thyroid, Medullary carcinoma of thyroid has a very, very typical amyloid which deposit. This is called ACAL. Okay. Apart from that, insulinomas also have amyloidosis. So these are two cancers which ha can have amyloid with them. Okay. So medullary carcinoma of thyroid typically has amyloid and insulinomas also have. Very good. Next, PG trivia and GK. Good. Okay. Apart from that, remember, myeloid has a tendency to deposit around the blood vessel and it can cause periorbital echymosis, that is panda eyes, that's very typical of myeloidosis. And macroglossia is also a classical feature of your primary myeloidosis, right? Okay. So, as we have just now seen that diagnosis of amyloidosis, abdominal fat aspiration is the easiest way to diagnose. So, this technique is just aspiration. You aspirate it and around the blood vessel amyloid is there and you see it under the Congo, uh, under the polarizing microscopy and you will be able to see the amyloid there, okay? So that's an easier way of diagnosing amyloid. Apart from that, if you take out the gross, grossly amyloid has a waxy appearance. Remember waxy appearance. And if you put Lugol iodine on amyloid, that area will become mahogany brown, which 
on which if you put sulfuric acid it will turn blue so it, this reaction is like amylase that is why this is called as amyloid okay that is why it is called as amyloid now once you're clear with this next you should remember that on histopathology amyloid is always extracellular pink material and when you put stain it with congo red it gets this salmon red that is orange red color this is salmon red appearance and this salmon red slide you should see under the polarizing microscopy and you will get apple green birefringence so you, then you will get apple green birefringence and that's the very important point here but remember what are the other stains of amyloid? Methyl violet and crystal violet is most rapid stain for amyloid. Thioflavin is an ultraviolet light which can be stained. And the non-specific stains are toledin blue. Remember, toledin blue is normally a stain for mast cells. Okay, but it can stain amyloid also. Alcine blue is normally a stain for acidic mucin. But it can also stain um, uh, amyloid also. Pass is normally a stain for neutral mucin and glycogen, okay, and glycogen and basement membranes and the fungal hyphae. But again, it can also give positivity for your amyloid. So this is this. Uh, these are non-specific stains which can give positivity for amyloid also. Everybody should remember methyl violet is not a supravital stain. It is a stain for amyloid. Okay, so they can ask you which is not a supravital stain. Supravital stain is basically stain which stains the live cells like reticulocytes. Okay, so methyl violet is not a supravital stain. Okay, right guys. So uh, on electron microscopy, if you see, you can see these um, um, amyloid as infinitely long fibrils like this and their diameter is fixed that is 7.5 to 10 nanometer but the length is infinitely long so they are very very long infinitely long fibrils like bamboo sticks okay and but the diameter is always fixed remember this is the classical electron microscopy of amyloid and you should never ever forget that okay now what is the diagnosis of choice? This is very, very important. It was again a question which came in your INICT super speciality exam and you should always know this. This is the recent thing. So diagnosis of choice of amyloid in today's time is laser micro dissection with mass spectrometry. That's the diagnosis of choice of amyloid and this was the option that came in your INICT super speciality exam. So please know this. That's the diagnosis of choice for your Alzheimer's, uh, for your uh, amyloid, right? Okay, so let's come to the next question. So neurosecretory bodies are seen in all except. Let me see how many of you can answer this question quickly. Perfect, guys. So neurosecretory bodies are basically are seen in the neuroendocrine tumors. And all the neuroendocrine tumors show you neurosecretory bodies. So adrenal cortical tumor is not a neuroendocrine tumor. So, it will not show you uh, neurosecretory bodies. Very good, GK and Shiva. Okay. So, uh, now coming to the, uh, this is how dense core granules or neurosecretory bodies appear. So, these are like balls. If you see something like this, like balls, you remember that this is very, very classical dense core granules. Okay. And remember, which are the neuroendocrine tumors of your body? Please remember it is neuroblastoma and pheochromocytoma, paraganglioma, small cell carcinoma of the lung, carcinoid tumor, medullary carcinomas of the thyroid and Merkel cell carcinoma of the skin. So please remember Merkel cell carcinoma of skin is a neuroendocrine tumor which shows you dot like positivity of CK20. Okay, so this is another important question that they can ask you. So normally CK20 is positive only in colon cancers. But dot-like positivity of CK20 is very typical of Merkel cell carcinoma of skin. And it is a typical tumor of elderly, like 70-year-old male, okay, presenting with a lesion in the skin. Okay, any neuroendocrine tumor will show you these kind of, you know, uh, this kind of chromatin. That is somewhere it is light, somewhere it is dark. This is what is called as uh, salt and pepper chromatin. If you look at the IHC, there is a very typical IHC in these cases. Remember, all the neuroendocrine tumors are positive for NSC, synaptophysin, chromogranin, bombesin, and CD56. Okay, so very good couple, you're right. And on electron microscopy, definitely there are dense core granules, which are also called as neurosecretory granules. 
Now, when I talk about paragangliomas, guys, remember pheochromocytoma is an intraadrenal paragangliomas, okay? Whereas extraadrenal uh, pheochromocytomas are paragangliomas. So anything like carotid body tumor, glomus tympanicum, glomus vagal, laryngeal paraganglioma, aortico pulmonary paragangliomas are all extraadrenal paragangliomas, which you should be knowing, okay? So there was again a question which was asked, which of the following is not a paraganglioma? So you should be knowing, you should know the term paragangliomas very well. Also remember, any paragangloma has a classical morphology and that morphology is Zellbalin. What is Zellbalin? That is nest of tumor cells are encircled by thin layer of sustentacular cells, which are S100 positive. So this is what is called as Zellbalin. So how do you identify these sustentacular cells? Remember, they are S100 positive. So if you put IHC, you can identify these nests of tumor cells which are lined by these sustentacular cells. So that is very, very classical of this, okay? Now, once you clear with this, everybody should remember which is not associated with pheochromocytoma. If somebody is asking which of the following is not associated with pheochromocytoma because when we're talking about pheochromocytoma, genetics is super important, okay? So, everybody should remember the genes of pheochromocytoma. This is super important. So, remember, pheochromocytomas are basically associated with MEN2, okay? So, they are associated with MEN2 and NF1, okay? So, neurofibroma 1. Remember, NF1 is basically associated with neurofibromas, okay? Neurofibromas. Please remember, I've posted an image of plexiform neurofibroma on my Instagram page. That is a very important tentative question. So, do see the image, okay? Apart from that, remember, NF1 can also cause pheochromocytoma, okay? Also, remember pheochromocytoma. Whereas, uh, remember, apart from that, we VHL gene, remember most common tumor to be associated with VHL is hemangioblastoma, okay? So most common tumor with VHL is something which has more vascularity. Hemangioblastoma is a tumor associated with cerebellar tumor, that is hemangioblastoma, okay? Apart from that, remember the enzyme mutation SDH, succinyl dehydrogenase, this is very classically associated with GISTs and paraganglioma, okay? So, GISTs are typically associated with succinyl dehydrogenase. Apart from that, there is a gene called as IPAS1. IPAS1 is basically associated with polycythemias, paraganglioma syndrome, okay? So, these are the syndromes, that, these are the genes you should be very, very clear with, okay? So, what are the other tumors which are associated with VHL? Remember, hemangioblastomas is there renal cell carcinoma and pheochromocytoma. So these are the tumors which you should remember. Apart from that, it is also associated with endolymphatic sac tumor and a lot of liver cysts. Right, guys? Okay. So this is a concept in the new edition of Robbins. Who's going to tell me this? And whoever will answer this will get a chocolate. Let me see how many of you can answer this question. Alternately, alternative lengthening of telomer is a phenomena characteristically noted in. So let me see who can answer this. Whoever will answer this will get a chocolate. So quick guys, let me see how many of you can answer this. Waiting, 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 waiting. Oh, very good, Sharnan and Shivam. You both get a chocolate. Good, guys. So, what is alternative length of uh, telomeres? Let me explain you this, guys. So, normal length of telomeres means what? So, normally, you know, som uh, our somatic cells do, uh, do not have telomerases. So, the, uh, so, what will happen? Telomeres get shortened. So, aging is associated with shortening of telomeres. Okay. So, shortening of telomeres is with aging. So, this is out. There is no lengthening of telomeres, okay? Aging is always shortening, okay? Now, normally cancers like small cell carcinomas, they express a gene called as TERT, which will increase the telomeres, okay? So, this is the classical pathway. This is not an alternative pathway. This is the classical pathway. Now, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, what they do is, they basically have a special mutation, okay? So, they have an activating mutation of two genes called as ATRX, that is alpha thalassemia X-related gene, alpha thalassemia mental retardation X-related gene, and DAX, that is death domain associated protein. So, whenever these genes are inactivated, this causes alternative lengthening of 
uh, telomeres. So that is why the, the cancer cells are cut, but it is not through telomerase pathway. This is due to inactivating mutation of ATRX and DAX. So this is what this pathway is called as inactivating mutations of uh, 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 ATRX and DAX causes alternative lengthening of telomeres. And that's a concept that everybody should be very, very clear with. Right, guys? Okay. Okay, now match the following. So whenever we are talking about pancreatic neuron tumors, we should be very clear with these. Quickly match. So necro necrolytic migratory erythema is a very typical morphology of glucagonoma. Amyloid deposition is seen in insulinoma. Okay, watery diarrhea, hypokalemia is very, very typically seen with VIPoma. VIPoma, please remember, even pheochromocytomas and neuroblastomas can be associated with VIPoma. And severe pap peptic ulcerations can be seen with gastrinomas, which are associated with Zollinger Ellison syndrome. So, these are some match the following, which everybody should be clear. Aditi, very good. You marked first. Necrolytic migratory erythema is typically seen with glucagonoma. It's a typical rash. So, everybody should be super clear with this okay okay so this is one question which comes every time in exam so we'll quickly read this this is massive splenomegaly with ellen uh, mayer flask abnormality this is very classically seen with with gotchers okay so all of you know gotchers you have to identify this has crumpled tissue paper appearance which you should be very classically uh, able to identify whereas if they show you foam cells you have to know foam cells are very characteristically seen with neiman pick disease okay so foam cells are neiman pick disease okay so guys i'm so sorry i'm not able to on my video somehow there is some connection problem uh, uh, i'm not able to uh, on my video my system is not uh, able to on the video so for that i'm really sorry maybe next time we can have a video uh video session like that okay so uh for now without video session okay so yes so this is your uh crumpled tissue paper appearance which is very very typical of your gotchas and uh remember mutation of glucocerebrosidase is a very important genetic risk factor for development of Parkinson's disease okay and if you remember uh, uh, Neiman Pick's disease remember Neiman Pick's disease are A, B and C and Neiman Pick A is the first alphabet here is N so A is always neuropathic it always is neuropathic and B is non-neuropathic whereas in Gotchas it is opposite okay it is 1, 2 and 3 and 1 is non-neuropathic okay so 1 doesn't have neuro uh, neural involvement usually okay usually okay so remember that way okay everybody should be clear okay I'll try, I'll post this PDF in, uh, on my uh, WhatsApp group, guys, okay? Remember, I'll post it in WhatsApp group so that you can revise it before your exams, okay? Right. So, uh, remember, gotchas, but it will not be annotated. That is another point uh, I would like to tell you, okay? So, gotchas, uh, one is basically non-neuropathic and Neiman pick because it starts with N. So, A is neuropathic. Always remember it is completely opposite. Please remember this because this can be a multiple choice question that can be asked. Okay. And this video will be available, guys. Okay. I, I'll post this video. Okay. Now, look at this. When we talk about the electron microscopy of the gotchas disease, it typically has distended lysosomes which contain stored lipid sacs, whereas Neiman pick will have your membranous concentric bodies. So, this is electron microscopy of both of them, which you should be very, very clear with. Okay. Now, apart from that massive splenomegaly, whenever they give you in history, remember hairy cell leukemia has massive uh, splenomegaly with pancytopenia and monocytopenia is very characteristic of hairy cell leukemia. Please remember everybody, the stain here is trap. Okay, so tartrate resistant acid phosphatase is the stain for hairy cell leukemia. Now, if I'm showing you this, this is your uh, garden party appearance which, where you can see all the shift cells together. This is your CML, which can present with massive splenomegaly, but it will have leukocytosis. And remember, the stain that we used for here is, for CML is NAP, okay? It is neutrophil alkaline phosphatase, okay? So, NAP is usually reduced in CML, but whenever CML is progressing into accelerated phase or blast phase, the NAP, uh, NAP will increase, NAP can increase, okay? 
whereas these are tear drop cells you know which you can see in primary myelofibrosis and uh, not only in primary even in secondary myelofibrosis the catch point is massive splenomegaly seen in myelofibrosis and if you do reticulin stain you will be able to see that there is reticulin fibrosis please remember the mutations here for hairy cell leukemia everybody has told very good 100% of hairy cell leukemia has BRAF V600E and I've already told you this is also an Instagram video for BRAF which everybody should revise and in CML the translocation is 922 and the transcript most commonly is 210 can 190 uh, transcript occur in CML yes it can occur uh, but uh, so remember it can occur but it is usually aggressive it has a higher tyrosine kinase activity majority of the time 190 transcript occurs in ALL okay so this is called as pH positive ALL okay please remember now in CML there is no accelerated phase but blast phase is still there okay and the cutoff for the blast phase is 20% myeloblast but any degree of lymphoblast if it is present it is called as high risk CML now okay so there is no accelerated CML now okay teardrop cells basically indicate fibrosis in the bone marrow it can be seen in primary myelofibrosis or secondary myelofibrosis uh, uh, very good uh, uh, asman hayagi very nice name so it it can occur in myelofistic anemias also where there is metastasis so teardrop basically just indicates some fibrosis in the bone marrow and remember if it is uh, primary myelofibrosis you have to see for jack2 mutation okay jack2 v617f mutation is 90 percent of the time associated with polycythemia vera but for 50 to 60 percent of the time they are associated with primary myelofibrosis also apart from that calor and mpl mutations are also associated with primary myelofibrosis right guys okay so everybody has to know this perfect guys okay so uh going to the next again massive splenomegaly you always have to look for these t-shaped structures guys this t is nothing but a kinetoplast and this body is ld body please remember ld bodies you have to remember ld bodies are typically seen with massive splenomegaly apart from that always remember the rings if you see multiple rings it is falciparum whereas if you see one thick ring it is usually vivex if you see these acoles acoles means something which is when the ring is at the periphery, when the nucleus is at the periphery like this, these are called as a coal forms. So, coal forms are very, very typical of falciparum. Apart from that, banana shaped gameto, yes, very good. Gametocyte is also very classical of falciparum. This is what you should always, always be clear. So, here is the catch point that also you should remember, guys. So, 2 to 5 micrometer, another body which is confused with LD body is histoplasma capsulatum. It is a misnomer, there is no capsule, okay. And it is always intracytoplasmic. So, LD body can be intracytoplasmic or extracytoplasmic. Histoplasma is always intro, intracytoplasmic and they are perfectly rounded bodies like this and they have a clear area around them. That is typical of histoplasma whereas ld body if you see they are also 2 to 6 microns but they usually have a kinetoplast like this okay so they are t-shaped structures which you should always always be clear with okay so that is classical of lishmania do not confuse histoplasma and lishmania lishmania can be both intracytoplasmic and extracytoplasmic Okay, guys, so when you're talking about the organism, it doesn't go complete without this organism. Always you should remember a saucer-shaped structure with a lot of bodies like this. This is very, very classical of molluscum contagiosum, which you should remember. So this is molluscum contagiosum, which is very, very, uh, everybody should be super clear with. And do not forget it. It is a very important and easy image-based question. And I am sure everybody can answer this. It's a repeat question. So I've just copied the same question and given it to you. So this is your molluscum. <clears throat> these are coilocytes please remember a resin like nucleus with a perinuclear halo is very typically coilocytes and coilocytes are basically produced because of e5 protein whereas the major pathogenic protein of hpv is e6 and e7 which all of you know okay so e6 and e7 okay so e6 basically targets p53 and tert you know that and e7 basically targets your uh, rb gene and your uh, p21 so that is what you should remember e6 and e7 okay and coilocytes are basically due to e5 that is what you have to remember okay 
and uh, one more feature if you remember e2 is the protein which can control the activity of e6 and e7 okay so master regulator of e6 and e7 is e2 okay so that is about hpv remember uh, the benign form of hpv can cause uh, laryngeal papillomas okay always remember that okay that is what you all have to remember okay so that's about hpv which you should always always be remembering please revise about the hpv vaccines also okay so remember this again this is your cmv virus which you should not confuse cmv can be asked anywhere in the body everybody should be clear about that and remember there are basophilic inclusions with a perinuclear halo and there are a lot of cytoplasmic inclusions also it can be classical owl eye or it can be single eye of the owl but remember the blue inclusion with the perinuclear halo is typically cmv and it can be given anywhere in the body it can be given in the lung it can be given anywhere in the body okay in the esophagus anywhere okay Please do not confuse your CMV with the RSL. RSL has always eosinophilic nucleoli. It doesn't have a perinuclear halo and the cytoplasm is perfectly clear. So these are your RSLs. Do not confuse RSLs where CMV has a basophilic inclusion and the peri-inclusion halo. Okay. Perfect guys. That is what you have to remember. Okay. So coming to the IHC, which can be given to you. So match the IHC marker with the tumors. And this is again a very important question. I hope everybody remembers. So carcinomas are always positive for CK. Okay, lymphomas. Just now I told you it is LCA or CD45. Both are same. Okay, so that's for lymphoma. Sarcomas are always vimentin. Please remember rhabdomyosarcoma or rhabdomyomas. Whenever they give you, it is desmin. You have to remember this. Okay, neuroendocrine tumors, whenever they give you the CD56, chromogranin, okay, chromogranin and synaptophysin, bombesin, all these are markers for your neuroendocrine tumors. Melanomas are see HMB45 positive. Please remember apart from that, picomas, that is perivascular epithelial cell tumors are also HMB45. Can anybody tell me one picoma? This is angiomyolipoma. Angiomyolipoma is one tumor of the kidney which occurs in the tuberous sclerosis patients. So angiomyolipoma is a, is a tumor which occurs in tuberous sclerosis patient and they are positive for HMB45. Please remember that. Gliomas are GFAP positive and squamous cell carcinoma of lung especially are P40 positive. Okay, so that is what you all have to be super, super, super clear. And that's the IHC marker which everybody should be clear with. So apart from that, mutation in the lung cancer is a very important question. Remember, small cell carcinomas have RB mutations most commonly. Squamous cell carcinoma, P53 is most common, followed by P16. Adenocarcinoma of lung, Keras mutation is most common. Remember, Keras and EGFR are mutually exclusive mutation. ALK mutations most commonly are associated with inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor. Always remember that. <clears throat> Okay, apart from that, they can be associated with adenocarcinomas of lung, anaplastic large cell lymphomas, okay, and neuroblastomas. Remember, cancer never smokers never have Keras mutation. So, never, never smokers never have Keras mutations, okay. And uh, always remember uh, plural tumors, if they are mesotheliomas, they have P16 loss, okay. And NF2 and BAP1, BAP1 is what? By BRC associated protein, okay. Or if it is a solitary fibrous tumor, it can have STAT6 mutation, okay. Please remember this. Apart from that, earliest mutation in lung cancer is always loss of 3P, okay. So, earliest mutation in lung cancer is loss of 3P. That everybody should be clear. Now, what is this? Quickly, this electron microscopy can be asked anytime. What is this quickly, guys? <laughs> this is mesothelioma. Perfect, guys. Long and thin microvilli. Whenever they, you are seeing, that is your uh, mesothelioma. Very good, Satvik. You were the first one to answer angiomyolipoma. I'm so proud of you. Good, good boy. Okay. Now, once we are clear with it, we should also know to identify the primary. We always use two IHC markers that are CK7 and CK20. And these are the two very, very important markers that you have to remember. And if I am uh, drawing a line, if I am drawing a line, remember, so above the 
colon so colon tumors are 20 positive and 7 negative anything which is above okay so usually they are 7 positive and 20 negative if they're both positive you have to remember bladder is the most common one which is both positive and if they're both negative you have to remember it is hepatocellular carcinoma kidney cell uh, renal cell carcinoma and prostate carcinoma so both negative are uh, your liver kidney and prostate Perfect, guys. That is clear. Apart from that, new IHC markers you have to remember because this is the question that has been asked. CDX2 is very, very classical for colon cancer. TTF1 and napsin is adenocarcinoma of lung. Please remember TTF1 can also be positive in small cell carcinomas. P40, P50 and P63 is squamous cell carcinoma. Chromogranin, synaptophysin and CD56 is small cell carcinoma. Okay, so that is what you all have to remember. And that's your markers that should be clear to everybody. Right, guys? Okay. Okay, guys. So once we are clear with this, remember, they can give you an image like this and they can ask you the profiling of the breast. Again, I have posted an update on this also on my Instagram. Please go through this because we will not have time to cover everything now. So just telling you that if there is nuclear positivity, it is ER and PR. And if it is membranous positivity, it is your HER2 new. So on that basis, uh, normally the uh, profiling of the breast should always be done by genotyping. But IHC can act as a surrogate marker because in countries like India, where we have poor finances, we do uh, the phenotyping on the basis of IHC. So you should be able to catch them on IHC. Please study and revise the phenotyping of the uh, breast cancers that is luminal type, luminal A, luminal B, uh, triple negative, HER2 new positive. Please revise all those, okay? Now, Let's go to this quickly. So 32 year old female who presents with menorrhagia and she gives history of fatigability and tongue shows following changes. What is the treatment? So guys, tongue is one thing which they have given you in exam so many times. So you should be very clear in iron deficiency. The features that are defined are scoironychia and there is papillary trophy and filiform papillae like this. Okay, so this basically has... Uh, absence of filiform papillae and there can be angular stomatitis so whenever they're giving you angular stomatitis you should remember it is iron deficiency whereas if you give they give you red beefy tongue like this okay red beefy tongue if they are giving you that is your uh, b12 deficiency that is what you all have to clearly remember whereas if they give you this tongue this is a strawberry tongue which is seen in kawasaki disease okay Let's come to the polyps of the intestine. That's another important question that they can ask you. So if they're asking you these, there, there are multiple polyps which are seen in three successive then generations. This is familial adenomatous polyposis and the most common mutation which is seen here is APC. So polyps of the intestine should be very, very clear to you. If we classify the polyps of the intestine, all of you know that we have uh, inflammatory polyp, we have uh, hematomatous polyp, we have hi hyperplastic polyp, which are benign polyps polyps and then we have malignant polyps okay so when we talk about hyperplastic polyp that is there is there's some disorder there isn't it so there you have to remember we have huge checker syndrome and juvenile polyps which is very very important okay so that is what you have to remember so look at this classical history that they give you and you should be very very clear with this okay so 11 to 22 year old male or female presents with intestinal obstruction this tube this and whenever you see this polyp with the mucocutaneous pigmentation you see this polyp there is an arborizing muscle going inside the polyp like this this is very very classical of Peutz-Jagger syndrome please remember Peutz-Jagger syndrome itself says PGS that is I have pigmentation I am in the jujunum and I, I have a mutation of STK11 so that is very very classical of P, uh, Peutz Jagger syndrome. Please remember Peutz Jagger syndrome themselves they are not neoplastic for colon cancers, but they can give rise to cancers in the other parts of body. And one of the most common tumor that they give causes sex cord stromal tumors. Okay, so they cause sex cord stromal tumor with annular tubules. That's very very uh, common tumor. Sex cord stromal tumor with annular tubules okay so that is that is one of the very classical cancer which is caused by uh, Peutz jagger syndrome which you should remember apart from that look at the another uh, here 
or another question this is a five year old child who presents with the polyp in the rectum and what is the diagnosis so when you see these kind of distended glands okay in the rectum this is very 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 classical of juvenile polyp please Please remember, this is juvenile polyp, which have SMAD mutations. So usually they are associated with SMAD mutations. And they also have pulmonary AV malformations, pulmonary AV malformations. And this usually occurs in the child and there are distended, yes, distended glands like this. Okay. So that's your uh, juvenile polyp. So pute Jagger polyp and juvenile polyp are hematomatous polyp. Apart from that, we also have hematomatous polyp syndromes. So in this, you have to remember, we have Cowden syndrome, which is hematomatous polyp syndrome. So uh, Cowden syndrome is a person becoming like a cow. So very bad cow I'm drawing. Okay. So, but what is the classical feature of the cow? That it has hyperkeratosis of hand and feet and it has skin appendageal tumors. And remember, this is a cow, okay? So, cow basically is because of P10, okay? So, what is the gene here? P10 gene is involved here, which is on 10P. And this syndrome is called as Cowden syndrome. And remember, uh, so again, it has skin appendageal tumor along with hematomatous tumors. Remember, if somebody asks you what is the most common mutation which you see here, uh, most common tumors you see here, you can say, I bet this looks like a cow. I bet this looks like a cow. So that is breast, endometrium and thyroid. So it has breast, endometrium and thyroid, which you should always remember. These are the cancers with Cowden syndrome. So Cowden syndrome has breast, endometrium and thyroid cancers. Okay. Right, guys, once you're clear with this, let's come to this question. So that was about polyps. Just quickly uh, revise the polyps. So pute checker syndrome, we have seen uh, typically 11 to 22 years and PJS, juvenile polyps, mad mutation and pulmonary AV malformation is very common. Okay, Cowden syndrome is P10. And remember, we have just now studied that it has BET. Okay, so breast, endometrium and thyroid. Please remember there is one more hematomatous polyp syndrome that is Cronchodite Canada syndrome. So Cronchodite Canada syndrome is like a doctor who wants to go to Canada, but he doesn't have a gene associated so there's no gene so that is that means it's non-hereditary so this usually occurs after the age of 50 okay because he's no gene so no gene is associated so he doesn't have a push so it will occur after the age of 50 years and again these patients have kya karte hai? Ghis -ghis ke kaam karte hai. so they will have nail atrophy or because they are working in the dhoop skin kya ho jati hai? hyperpigmented ho jati hai. hyperpigmented skin ho jati hai aur nail atrophy ho jati hai. that is very classical of Cronchodite Canada syndrome Okay, and apart from that, tuberous sclerosis can also cause a lot of hematomatous polyps. Remember that, okay? And tuberous sclerosis is associated with very unique syndromes in the body, very unique tumors in the body. Like it causes angiomyolipoma in the kidney and it could causes rhabdomyomas in the heart. So these two you should never, never forget, okay? Apart from that, we know FAP syndromes are basically due to APC. And there are two FAP syndromes that you should always remember. One is Gardner syndrome. Remember, Gardner syndromes are very classically associated with, it's a Gardner. So Gardner, if you look at your stomach, it's very tight. So what is it? Desmoid tumor. Hota hai. And plus they have osteoma and they have dental abnormalities. That is Gardner. And Turcot syndrome is like turban. So it has medulloblastoma. So, tumor in the brain, medulloblastoma. Please remember, it is not turban tumor. Turban tumor, kis ko kehte hai? Cylindroma ko. Okay. So, turban tumor is cylindroma. That is one thing you all have to remember. Okay. So, that's about your uh, polyps. That you should be clear. Now, let's come back to the malabsorption question. So, this is an intestinal biopsy from a person. And this person presents with fatigue, diarrhea, bloating, and this is what is seen. So remember, this is the villi normally. But here, what is happening is there is villi atrophy. There is no villi here, but the crypts are getting elongated. And there are a lot of lymphocytes in between. So that is very, very classical of celiac disease okay so very very classical of celiac disease okay so pute jagger you just know there is muscle which is going whipples we will talk later okay so this is not whipples and this is not ulcerative colitis so let's look at this so when we talk about malabsorption guys there are three type of malabsorption syndromes that everybody should be clear we have celiac disease we have whipples disease and we have tropical sprue so celiac disease is an autoimmune disease what happens is this occurs due to gluten what is gluten wheat dry oat and barley it is not gluten, rice. So, jisko gluten sensitivity hoti hai, usko kya khana chahiye? Usko chawal khane chahiye. He should eat rice. Okay. So, gluten basically produce glyndin. 
okay so whenever this glyndin is produced an enzyme acts on it that is ttg that is trans tissue glutaminase okay this is an enzyme which acts and this enzyme turns glyndin into deamylated glyndin okay so what happens in deamylated glyndin basically normal kisi ko antigen nahi lagta it's normal for everybody okay but what happens in some patient is that they have an autoimmune disease so they have polymorphisms of hla dq2 and dq8 so these are basically hla d is present in antigen presenting cells so antigen presenting cells basically go and present it abnormally to th1 cells which start producing interferon gamma and they start thinking that deamylated glyndin is an antigen so b cells start producing antibodies against deamylated glyndins okay so apart from that they start producing anti endomycelial antibody antibodies against ttg antibodies against deamylated glyndins so then it becomes a problem so what happens is these t cells okay apart from that cd8 cells also get activated and they also start destroying so these t cells start destroying the villi so there is villus atrophy which you see and the crypt enlargement and B cells start producing antibodies. So for the diagnosis of celiac disease, you require two things: you require a histopathology and you require serology. Both of them should be there. Okay. So remember, the antibodies can either be an your own self antibodies, that is anti TTG and anti deamylated glyndins, or they can be antibodies, anti endomycelial antibodies. So anti endomycelial antibodies are quite sensitive and specific. Okay. So that's celiac disease. So if you look at the morphology, okay. So this basically shows you villus atrophy, crypt enlargement, and that there are a lot of lymphocytes here. And basically, they produce uh, because there are a lot of T lymphocytes here. So they are they predispose the person to T cell lymphomas. Okay. So uh, remember, patients with celiac disease produces T cell lymphomas. That is what you all have to very classically know. So they produces T cell lymphomas. Now once we are clear with this, let's go to the second disease. that is whipple's disease so whipple's disease is an infective disease which is due to trophyrema whipplei which is due to trophyrema whipplei so trophyrema whipplei basically is a pathogen which is taken up eaten up by the macrophages and basically what they do is there is lamina propria becomes distended by the macrophages okay so all the lamina propria becomes distended by the macrophages and it obstructs the lymphatics so lymphatics becomes dilated okay so lymphatics becomes dilated that is very classic of this patient you should remember so this is what happens in your uh, whipple's disease okay so that is very very classical and you should always remember that okay so that is whipple's disease which has prominence of uh, uh, um, pass positive macrophages in the lamina propria okay that's about your malabsorption that everybody should be very very clear okay now let's come to the cytology question so this is a 45 year old male with swelling in the back and fnac was done and you see these fat globules coming out from this so this is lipoma lipoma will just have these fatty fragments which are coming out so remember lipoma is like this and there is fat and there is a peripherally placed nucleus that is lipoma whereas if you see like these scalloping okay so nucleus start showing scalloping like this this is liposarcoma and liposarcomas are very common in retroperitoneum and one of the most common mutations which are associated with that is mdm2 mutations are very common in liposarcoma so scalloping when you start seeing okay so when you start seeing scalloping that is very very typical of liposarcoma okay liposarcoma now if you look at the liposarcoma what is the mutation so there is a entity called as myxoid liposarcoma which has a mutation of 1216 okay 1216 that is very very classically seen okay very good asman hai again kapil you diagnose perfectly as lipoma perfect okay so myxoid liposarcoma have 1216 mutation whereas infantile fibrosarcoma this was the question you know this was one of the jinx question that i had posted one day before the exam so please remember this is one mutation you have to remember remember infant kon hota hai 12 months ka hota hai and fibrosarcoma is 16 so uh, so 1215 sorry so how do you remember this 1215 see 5 is 15 so fibrosarcoma is 15 okay so 15 so 12 15 is infantile fibrosarcoma liposarcoma is 12 16 okay so fibrosarcoma is 12 15 okay that is very very classical you have to remember here okay so that's infantile fibrosarcoma 
okay so please remember again the second tumor that they uh, they can give you uh, in exam is basically your cavernous hemangioma which has large dilated cisterns filled with the blood remember most common benign tumor of the liver is cavernous hemangioma whereas capillary hemangioma small capillaries which you can see here you have to remember one tumor which is very typically seen in the gums of the pregnant female that is called as pyogenic granuloma okay so please remember pyogenic granuloma is a it's a lobular capillary hemangioma. So lobular capillary hemangioma is your pyogenic granuloma. Okay, that is very classical and you should remember that. Okay, so pyogenic granuloma is a tumor, gum tumor which occurs in the gum and it is a lobular capillary hemangioma. That is what you have to remember. Okay, whereas if you see something like these, okay, so these are staghorn vessels. So staghorn vessels are very typical of hemangiopericytoma. Okay, so this is your hemangio pericytoma okay manjo pericytoma yes okay so that is what you have to be very very clearly available okay so now who is going to answer this question so this is a tumor which can occur from the age group of 0 to 60 years and it can mostly occurs in head and neck and what classically catches your eyes is this these are spider legs which are coming so these are spider cells and why they are spider cells is because there is lot of glycogen and because of the glycogen you can only see the cytoplasmic extensions which are there okay so that is very very classical of rhabdomyoma okay so that's classical of rhabdomyoma which you should remember rhabdomyoma is a tumor of heart which is usually seen in tuberous sclerosis. So, rhabdomyoma is a, so, sorry, it's a tumor of the skeletal muscle. But this tumor is very common in the heart in patients of tuberous sclerosis. Okay, that's the point you should always remember. So, rhabdomyoma is very commonly seen in the tuberous sclerosis patient in the heart. Okay, rhabdomyoma. Okay, remember, it's not rhabdomyosarcoma. It's rhabdomyoma. It's a benign tumor. Okay, remember, what is rhabdomyosarcoma image like? So, they usually give you image of botroid embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma, which is also called as sarcoma botroides. And you should remember, this usually occur in children, one to five years, and it can occur in any cavity of the body. And there is, you know, cluster of tumor cells below the epithelium. So, this layer is called cambium layer what is this layer called cambium layer please remember that's very very typical of embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma and they have tennis racket shaped cells so all the cells here are tennis racket shaped cells okay so that's very very classical of embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma which can occur in any cavity remember that okay so in contrast to that suppose if you see a clear zone below the epithelium like this and they say it as a grand zone okay so with the epithelium atrophy this is very typically very typical of lepromatous leprosy so lepromatous leprosy has a clear zone below the epithelium this is called grand zone and that is seen in lepromatous leprosy lepromatous leprosy so guys, uh, I'm sorry because you can't see me. So if you're getting bored, you can let me know. I can close the session anytime. Okay. So apart from that, remember there are foamy cells which are seen in lepromatous leprosy because it has lot very high load of mycobacterium lepra. So macrophages eat them and become foamy. And these foamy cells which are seen in lepromatous leprosy are called as virtuo cells what are they called as virtuo cells and if you put uh wade fight stain please remember everybody wade fight stain okay so i'm going to write here wade fight stain okay so this is your zn stain modified zn stain for leprosy so if you put wade fight stain you will see globi that is bundles of lepromatous leprosy okay so bundles of lepromatous leprosy you can see it here okay Right, guys, so is everybody clear with this? Yes, so that is about your uh, lepromatous leprosy, which everybody should be clear. There should be grand zone in that. Okay, so that's very, very classical. Okay, so remember, it's opposite of cambium layer. Okay, okay, opposite of cambium layer. You should be very, very clear with this. Okay, okay, guys. So uh, remember, whenever we're talking about soft tissue sarcomas, okay, yes, neat PG uh, trivia, perfect fight flaco stain is same as Wade fight stain. <coughs> that is Wade fight only. So you're saying fight freco, that is Wade fight freco only, okay? Right. So uh, remember the mutations, guys. Again, I'm adding two mutations here of the soft tissue tumor. You have to remember, okay? So remember. 
synovial sarcoma has a very classical mutation of x18 that's a classical mutation so how will you remember that ss synovial sarcoma okay so ss is shaadi phase shaadi can you can do shaadi only when you are in 18 years of age okay so shaadi shaadi can be done only when you are 18 years so x18 okay so when girls are 18 x is 18 then you can do shaadi shaadi so that synovial sarcoma that is x18 and in this remember synovial sarcoma is a very classical sarcoma which has epithelial component also so it's a biphasic sarcoma and therefore it shows metastasis to the lymph node also so it has pseudo glandular structures that you have to remember whereas very confusing with it is alveolar soft part sarcoma please remember alveolar soft part sarcoma has x7 x17 okay so x17 okay so x alveolar soft part sarcoma is 17 okay so 17 is soft part okay so soft part sarcoma is x17 okay okay whereas remember everybody that uh, when we talk about alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma which is very very rare so this is 113 or 213 okay rhabdomyosarcoma basically is 13 okay so 113 or 213 right okay so please remember and do not confuse so infantile fibrosarcoma is infant and fibro so 1215 whereas synovial sarcoma is shaadi shaadi that is x Girls are going to do shadi at eight uh, at eighteen. So X eighteen is your synovial sarcoma. Okay, whereas alveolar soft part sar sarcoma is seventeen X seventeen. Okay, that's what you have to remember. Okay, guys. So coming to nodular fasciitis, this is one question which I had given you in the quizzes also. So please remember, it is one tumor which has lot of extravasated RBCs. That's the question that they ask you, and it's a self-limited condition. And the mutation here is USP six. Remember, USP six is also a mutation which is seen in aneurysmal bone cysts. Okay, so that is what you have to remember for nodule uh, nodular fasciitis. It's a self-limited condition. It will heal by its own. Okay. So now coming to a very stat question, I am sure all of you will be able to answer. This is an adult patient who has asteroid bodies and non-gazeting granulomas. What is it? So this is your sarcoidosis. All of you know. Remember the images. No cacheation in the center. Only epithelial cells with asteroid bodies and calcified bodies like this. This is blue. uh calcium is always bluish purple okay so this bluish purple bodies are called schumann bodies which you all have to remember so schumann bodies and asteroid bodies are very typical of sarcoidosis please remember everybody sarcoidosis always show metastatic calcification that's one point you all have to remember metastatic calcification is very typically seen in sarcoidosis okay now always remember but if you see this pink color material in the tumor in the center this is your caseation necrosis caseous necrosis is usually seen in tb this you have to remember okay so this is uh, caseous necrosis with epithelial cell and you can see here langhan giant cells that may even makes a diagnosis of tb more suggestive okay apart from that everybody you should remember what is this disease called kikuchi's disease so remember kikuchi disease is a self limiting lymphadenopathy you should remember and in this you also have necrosis this is also necrotizing lymphadenopathy but whenever there is necrosis there should be a uh, neutrophils isn't it but kikuchi disease is one disease where necrosis is there but there are no neutrophils there are histiocytes so this is called as so kikuchi's disease is called as histiocytic okay what is this called as histiocytic necrotizing necrotizing lymphadenitis okay okay so this is basically an immune condition and it is called as histiocytic necrotizing lymphadenitis and it is self resolving condition it is a self resolving condition that you have to remember that's kikuchi's please remember what is kimura anybody who can tell me what is kimura disease Kimura disease is one disease where you get eosinophilic eosinophilic abscesses. Again, this is a lymphadenopathy. Eosinophilic abscesses are seen in Kimura's disease. Okay. Again, who will tell me what is Rosai Dorfman disease? What is Rosai Dorfman disease? So in Rosai Dorfman disease, you will see emperipolysis. Okay. So that what is emperipolysis mean? Emperipolysis means whenever histiocytes start eating other cells, but they will not. 
they will just engulf but they will not kill it okay so rosoid ophman diseases whenever there is imperipolysis okay so massive lymphadenopathy with imperipolysis is rosoid ophman disease which everybody should be super 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 clear in it okay right guys so that is some lymphadenitis which all of you should remember ki kuchis is histocytic necrotizing Kimura is eosinophilic abscesses and rosoid of man is imperipolysis. So roses are one cell in other cell. That is imperipolysis. Okay. So cell. Okay. So cell in cell is imperipolysis. Okay. Not cell in cell. You should say it should be cell eats up other cell but doesn't kill it. Okay. So that is imperipolysis. Okay. Right, guys. Apart from that, you have to remember these images. Who can identify these cells? What are seen here? This is your caseous necrosis. These are your Langhorne cells. These are your epithelioid cells, and this is caseating epithelioid cell necrosis. That is very, very clear. That should be clear to you, everybody. Now, what is this? So, this also you should remember. Fungus is one of the image-based question, and I am sure all of you can answer this. Mucor is mota. Okay, mota means बहुत mota. So it's a mota fungus, and because it is mota, it doesn't have septate. It cannot put belt because it's very mota. So it is aseptate. Doesn't have septa. No septa is there. Okay, so aseptate fungus which branches at right angle. Why? Because it cannot bend because it's very mota. Okay, so remember. So mucor is a mota fungus which branches at ninety degree, and it is aseptate. जबकि अगर आप एस्परजिलस देखोगे तो एस्परजिलस इज ए ए मतलब इट ब्रांचेस एट ए क्यूट एंगल एंड इट हैज बेल्ट्स इट इज सेप्टेड सो इट हैज सेप्टा इट हैज वेरी गुड सेप्टा एंड इट ब्रांचेस एट ए क्यूट एंगल एंड इट इज अ डाइकोटमस फंगस यू नो डाइकोटमस का क्या मतलब होता है वन विल गिव राइज टू 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 विल गिव राइज टू फोर फोर विल गिव राइज टू एट एट विल गिव राइज टू सिक्सटीन लाइक दैट it's a dicotomous fungus okay so that is what you have to remember it keeps on branching like this so you get balls so that is why you get aspergillus balls aspergillomas okay that is very 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 suggestive okay so remember which stain will pick them up either you can use past stain or you can use silver stain so this black color stain is silver silver methamine stain okay that is black color stain or past can also give you this and what is this body here which is seen this is called fruiting body okay so this body here which is shown here is called fruiting body okay right guys so now uh when we uh, so no granulomas can finish without this stellate granulomas guys so stellate granulomas again there is a central uh a central collection of neutrophils in this and it is a star shaped granuloma this is cat scratch disease which everybody should remember so cat scratch disease is basically caused by bartonella hensinae and it has a star shaped granuloma which you should be very very clear with it okay right so that is stellate granuloma it can go in various direction because the central part of the granuloma contains abscess so please remember when i say necrotizing lymphadenitis it means any necrosis okay it doesn't even mean uh, it can be caseous necrosis in tb or it can be non caseating necrosis like kikuchi's disease or it can be uh, cat scratch disease or it can uh, it can be uh, it can be vaginal's disease which has you know geographical necrosis so all these are necrotizing necrosis okay apart from that you should remember somebody ask you this donut granuloma so where do you see these donut granuloma who is going to tell me donut granulomas where do you see this so these are seen in q fever okay donut granulomas are seen in q fever and if a patient is taking allopurinol so you can see these in the liver okay apart from that dirk granuloma somebody say where do you see dirk granuloma it is seen in malaria falciparum malaria but in brain that's the question that they ask you where do you see them you see them in brain so these are some questions on granulomas that they ask you okay okay so let's go to the next question here Five year old boy with itchy lesions of the scalp, and there are a lot of lit lytic lesions and electron microscopy. This is seen. What is this, guys? These are Burbeck granules. These are tennis racket shaped structures, which you can see here. Okay, so they are pentalaminar. Please remember, they are pentalaminar. You have to remember that, and they are tennis racket shaped structures. So they are Burbeck granules. Okay, so they are Burbeck granules. and please remember they are typically seen in langerhans cell histiocytosis and if you have to identify them what is the cd marker that you will use you can use s100 you can use hladr okay you can use cd1a and langerin that is cd207 okay so these are the cd markers which you can use here so these are the cd markers which are used for 
Langerhans cell is cytosis. That should be very, very clear to everybody. Okay. So remember, whenever we are talking about lytic lesion in the scalp, you have to remember that lytic lesions in the scalp can either be due to myeloma, where you should be very clear in identifying plasma cells. Remember, plasma cells are extremely blue cells. Okay, so extremely blue cells and they have uh, eccentrically placed nucleus and there is a perinuclear half here. The perinuclear half is because of extensive Golgi apparatus. So there is extensive Golgi apparatus and that is why you see a perinuclear half in plasma cells. Whereas lytic lesions of the scalp can also be seen in LCH. So what catches your eye in LCH is there are lots and lots of eosinophils. So eosinophils are the predominant cell but it, in between there are these Langerhans cells which are immature dendritic cells which have grooves in them. So these grooves should catch your eyes. So these grooves are very typical of Langerhan cells and you should remember these Langerhan cells have grooves and everybody we should be super clear with this that uh, these cells are also called as coffee bean nucleus so whenever I'm talking about coffee bean nucleus you should remember that they can be seen either in Langerhan cell histiocytosis if they are with eosinophils they can be seen in granulosa cell tumor where they form follicles which are called as collexinar bodies they can be seen in papillary carcinoma of thyroid along with that in papillary carcinoma of thyroid you will see orphan anii nucleus they can be seen in Brenner's tumor also in which you will see transitional epithelium. So these points should be very very clear with this. So box here which you should be remembering here. So what is the box? So coffee bean nucleus is seen in LCH where there are eosinophils. Okay collexinar bodies if they say collexinar bodies are seen in granulosa cell tumor with orphan any nucleus if you see groups this is very uh, classical of papillary carcinoma of thyroid and in cases with transitional epithelium, if you are seeing in the ovary, you should think of Brenner's tumor, okay? So, these are the tumors where you see coffee bean nucleus, right? Okay, one more condition where you can see these grooves is chondroblastoma. Very good, Satvik. Okay, so chondroblastoma also has this. So, in chondroblastoma, you will see chicken wire calcification. So, chicken wire calcification and the... And uh, coffee bean nucleus should always make you think of chondroblastoma okay so that's perfect guys okay so let me see uh, how well have you read skin okay so skin pathology okay so i try to add rare questions which can be asked so uh, hope some of it comes in your exam and helps you so which histological feature is absent in psoriasis quickly guys Oh my goodness, Satvik is saying CCC. Very good. Okay. So, yes, the answer is C. Okay. So, uh, so yes, very good. Next PG trivia. So, everybody should remember whenever I'm talking about psoriasis, it has a very typical feature called hypogranulosis. So, there is, you know, test tube appearance like this. Yes, perfect. There is suprapapillary thinning. Okay. So, but the granular layer is very, very thinned out. Okay. So, granular layer is very, very thin thinned out in psoriasis okay so always remember that if i am talking about collection of neutrophils this collection of neutrophils can either occur in the stratum corneum and that is called as moonro microapsis if they occur in stratum spinosum these are called as kojog okay so these are called as kojog so hypogranulosis is seen in um, psoriasis not hyper so where do you see hypergranulosis which condition do you see that th there is thickening of the granular layer it is like and planus so can you see these blue cells here so these blue cells are granular layer so it's very thickened here so like and planus okay so like and planus is a condition where you see hypergranulosis and along with that you will see here saw to thing because there is so much lymphocytic infiltrate in the interface that this will cause saw toothing of the uh, epithelium. So, saw toothing of the epithelium is a classical feature of lichen planus and sometimes, you know, so much lymphocytes can even uh, show you apoptotic bodies here. These apoptotic bodies are called as 
civet bodies what are these called as civet bodies okay so they are called as civet bodies so civet bodies are apoptotic bodies which you see in lichen planus okay so when i am talking about skin abscesses please remember potrier's micro abscesses are very characteristic of mycosis fungoides okay so potrier's micro abscesses are seen in mycosis fungoides okay so when i am talking about bulla everybody should remember supra basal bulla that is this basal cells are intact like row of tombstones so supra basal bulla is because of pemphigus well is seen in pemphigus vulgaris where basically you have antibodies against desmoglein 3 more than desmoglein 1 whereas when you have whole epithelium separating from the dermis that is epithelium uh, epithelium is getting separated from the dermis this sub epidermal bulla is seen in bullous pemphigoid so how do you differentiate them by immunofluorescence so on immunofluorescence if you see fish net pattern okay this is very classically because of which antibodies igg1 and igg4 okay so this direct immunofluorescence is always done in normal appearing perilesional skin this is very classical of pemphigus any pump pemphigus will show you fish net pattern it can be pemphigus vulgaris pemphigus foliaceus any pemphigus will show you fish net pattern till the time the antibodies are against desmogleins whereas if the antibodies are against hemidesmosomes this is classically seen in bullous pemphigoid which i have explained you earlier also so many times remember the antibodies here are against hemidesmosomes okay that is bp antigen 2 bullous pemphigoid antigen 2 and it gives you a linear pattern that is why it gives you a linear pattern whereas there is another condition which is a very itchy lesion and uh, which you have in the external surfaces of the skin in which you will have collection of the neutrophils there will be separation at the tips of the papilla this is because of ig antibody okay uh, reacts with the epithelium right so this is typically of typically seen in dermatitis herpetiformis and here the antibodies are usually iga antibodies okay so the antibodies are iga antibodies which you all have to be very very clear with okay so that's some conditions in the skin pathology that can be asked to you okay so coming to the next question which is not a part of innate immunity guys so if somebody ask you which is not a part of innate immunity so always remember who will tell me which is not a part of innate immunity in this quickly guys so yes so b lymphocytes okay so b lymphocytes are not a part of innate immunity so good guys so this is not a part of innate immunity so whenever we talk about innate immunity guys so we have we have the normal antibodies the defensins the lectins the complements which are part of innate immunity what are these gamma delta um, t lymphocytes so gamma delta lymphocytes are those cells okay so they are a part of innate immunity so these are those cells which can take which can which can accept the antigen even without mhc complex so gamma delta t lymphocytes are very very important cells which can accept the antigen without mhc complex they are usually present in the mucosal sites okay they usually present in the mucosal sites okay and uh, remember gamma delta lymphomas are very very bad lymphomas because they usually present with massive lymph uh, massive splenomegalies okay so remember this so this gamma delta t cells are a part of innate immunity they are present in the mucosa of the gi system or the genito urinary system and they can accept the antigen even without uh, not uh, without mhc complex so that's about gamma delta t cells which you should be clear whereas antigen presenting cells should always give the antigen to the t lymphocyte and these antigen presenting cells are either b lymphocytes or dendritic cells or macrophages so these are your antigen presenting cells okay so b lymphocytes are a part of antigen presenting cells plus they are also part of humoral immunity because they can produce antibodies against the antigens okay so that should be very very clear okay so guys go ahead and identify this technique what is the technique showing uh, shown here so everybody knows this technique is called fish fluorescent in situ hybridization and normally in fish we use two colors so you can identify two colors normally you should have two signals so here 
probably there is deletion of one signal we don't know what is the gene so we cannot interpret it till now but whatever is it, it is there is what deletion of one gene here so this technique is basically fish it, it is a very powerful technique but the drawback of this technique is it can be used only when the disease causing mutation is known remember that that's the thumb rule of fish you can use it only when the disease causing mutation is known okay so that is fish if you use five color fish if you use five color fish that is called as sky that is spectral karyotyping what is that called as spectral karyotyping spectral karyotyping is five color fish that everybody should be very clear okay please revise your ana antibodies guys i put a video of it on your instagram so please remember the patterns quickly they can be asked to you in exam uh, we have already discussed about it in instagram and there's a video please remember that i'm just showing you a pattern the rim pattern is always against double standard dna homogeneous pattern is against the chromatin please see the detailed video on the instagram on my instagram channel that is dr vanna pathology please go through this nucleolar pattern is antibodies against rna this is speckled pattern when you look like a powdery pattern here this is against non dna nuclear constituents and these are your centromeric antibodies they are multiple well defined dots okay right so that is systemic sclerosis so mug is asking fish can't pick point mutations so uh, fish basically can pick up best deletions and translocations okay that is what it can pick up and remember uh, it can pick up only those mutation when you know the disease causing mutation because you have to use probes in this that is fluorescent probes in it so if you don't know the disease causing mutation you can't pick them up okay okay next Im Im important image that can be asked you is polarizing microscopy guys polarizing microscopy we have already talked we have talked about a myelodosis on congruent stain you see apple green birefringence okay but remember gout and pseudo gout is another question that you should remember here so if i'm talking about pseudo gout always remember pcr that is pseudo gout has calcium pyrophosphate crystals and they are always rhomboid and they are positive by the positive refringence okay so that is pcr positive that you should always remember remember inflammation is usually milder than gout and very good satvik so for polarizing microscopy we have to use a dichroic mirror there's a special mirror that you use for polarizing microscopy this is called dichroic mirror apart from polarizing microscopy dichroic mirror is also used in flow cytometry okay so flow cytometries also have dichroic mirror okay so remember pcr plus is a code for pseudo gout so these are rhomboid crystals which you can see these are very typical of pseudo gout okay whereas needle shaped crystals are very classical of gout so remember the gun gout have urate crystals and they are negatively birefringent they are negatively birefringent okay so remember gun and pcr positive so please remember this is an image that they can give you so whenever we have large uh, needle shaped crystals they will appear like cloud like this like a cotton wool like structure and there will be lot of giant cells around it because gout induces lot of inflammation please remember gout acts through which it activates nod like receptors so it's basically a danger signal so whenever the uric acid is increased this activates nod like receptors which causes uh you know which causes lots and lots of inflammation okay so also remember synovium can become very very hyperplastic and this is what is called as uh, hyperplastic and thickened and it forms a penis and uh, gout is always needle shaped crystals always remember okay so please remember needle shaped crystals when you are seeing okay so this is very typical gout whereas rhomboid crystals when you are seeing it is always pseudo gout okay now let's come to the bone pathology again a very important question that which they ask you in bone pathology is uh, basically this specially who can answer this question let me see that first
ओके सो लोकेश लोकेश इज सेइंग दैट व्हाट इज द स्टेन दैट यू यूज्ड इन फ्लो साइटोमेट्री इट इज फिटसी ओके दैट इज फ्लोरो आइसोथायोसाइनेट इज द स्टेन व्हिच वी यूज इन फ्लो साइटोमेट्री ओके सो दिस ट्यूमर इज योर जॉइंट सेल ट्यूमर गाइस रिमेंबर हियर द न्यूप्लास्टिक सेल्स आर ऑलवेज द स्ट्रोमल सेल्स दे आर नॉट द जॉइंट सेल्स ओके सो न्यूप्लास्टिक सेल्स आर डेफिनेटली योर स्ट्रोमल सेल्स दे आर द न्यूप्लास्टिक सेल्स always remember in joint cell tumor there is activation of rank rankle okay so rank pathway especially activated in joint cell tumor that is why we always give treatment okay which basically uh, which basically uh, is given against rank pathway okay so that's is true and this tumor is a benign tumor it is not a high grade malignancy okay it's a benign tumor it's not a high grade um, malignancy and lesion this lesion typically uh, shows you uh, even though it's a benign tumor it can show you cortical destruction and soft tissue involvement so it never is wrong okay so it can show you cortical destruction and your soft tissue involvement okay so that is also seen in this tumor remember okay so that is very very that should be very very clear so the answer is c so treatment of uh, of giant cell tumor basically is the therapy against rankle and remember this tumor is also called as osteoclastoma and it arises from the epiphysis it arises from the epiphysis okay please remember the mutation of bone tumors i put a chart here that you should quickly remember okay so starting with the most easiest one that is osteochondroma osteochondroma usually has a mutation of x1 and x2 which basically decreases the parent sulfate and there is decrease in the indian hedgehog pathway so please remember if somebody is asking sonic hedgehog pathway sonic hedgehog pathway mutations are seen in medulloblastomas okay medulloblastoma and and which syndrome gorlin syndrome so gorlin syndrome basically there is over activity of sonic hedgehog pathway why because in uh, gorlin syndrome we have deletion of patch gene so patch gene is a gene which controls sonic hedgehog pathway so if there is deletion of patch gene there is over activity of sonic hedgehog pathway which causes multiple basal cell carcinomas okay so i always make a code which i tell to students gora so whenever somebody is gora he puts patches on his skin to protect himself from the uv light okay if there is deletion of patch if there is deletion of patch gene it's a tumor suppressor gene this causes over activity of sonic hedgehog pathway which causes multiple basal cell carcinomas okay so that is what happens in gorlin syndrome okay so remember whenever there is over activity of uh, sonic hedgehog pathway there is medulloblastomas of the brain and there is basal cell carcinomas okay multiple basal cell carcinomas of the skin okay now if i'm talking about uh, osteochondroma guys so we have talked about indian hedgehog pathway there is deletion of de there is decreased activity of indian hedgehog pathway in osteochondromas okay now next is chondrosarcomas chondrosarcomas basically there is activation of idh1 and idh2 okay and cdkn2a uh, gene okay so remember cdkn2a is very very typical uh, of chondrosarcoma also remember idh1 and idh2 is most commonly mutated in oligodendrogliomas okay 90% of the oligodendrogliomas have idh1 and idh2 mutation aneurysmal bone cyst you all know that we have usp6 mutation osteosarcomas occur due to chromothripsis what is chromothripsis when the chromosome ruptures okay it shatters then there is osteosarcomas apart from that there is rb gene mutations commonly seen in osteosarcomas okay ewing sarcoma we know that ewing sarcoma is a round cell tumor of the skin and there is 1122 translocation and everybody should remember that 1122 translocation is there and uh, we use cd99 or mic2 ion ihc which can pick them up okay so cd99 positivity is seen in ewing sarcoma okay right so that is ewing sarcoma and it it uh, usually arises from diaphysis okay now giant cell tumor mutation is very very important please remember that there is an acquired mutation in the gene coding for histone 3.3 that is the mutation for giant cell tumor it is an acquired mutation for gene coding uh histone 3.3 that is a mutation of giant cell tumor which you all should be clear 
so remember this this is your uh, you know tumor which is producing uh, cortical disruption and you can see this as a cordman triangle on the x-rays also and this is what is chromothripsis that is chromosome shatters and then it stitches haphazardly and that causes lot of activation of uh, proton oncogenes and deletion of tumor suppressor gene that is typical osteosarcomas okay now let's come to technique some techniques that they can ask you Yes, Satvik, very good. Ewing sarcoma is rich in glycogen. So, they are positive for past stain and they are diastase sensitive. Please remember what is diastase? Diastase is an enzyme which eats up which eats up glycogen. Okay. So, that's very, 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 very uh, suggestive of glycogen. Whenever something is diastase sensitive, that is um, that means that it is glycogen. So, Ewing sarcoma contains a lot of glycogen. Rhabdomyoma contains a lot of glycogen. So, they are uh, past positive diastase sensitive okay whereas alpha 1 antitrypsin globules are diastase resistant okay because they are not made up of glycogen okay so past positive diastase resistant is alpha 1 antitrypsin globules okay right guys so what is the correct order of fi fixation histopathology fixation who's going to tell me this what do you do first in histopathology fixation so this is a uh, this is a technique which everybody should be clear so whenever we are processing no so whenever we are processing we should be very clear that once we are processing after that it should be actually not fixation it should be what is the correct order of uh, processing okay so that should be the question okay so what is the correct order of histopathology processing that should be the order here so please remember the first thing that we do is fixation Okay, so first we fix it. Fix it. Why do we fix it? So most common fixative that we use, use in histopathology is ten percent buffered neutral formalin. This is done because uh, so that tissue can remain as it is in the body. So that is what we do in fixation. After fixation, we should do uh, four steps, which is very very important. Remember. DCIE. Okay, so there is a book called DACI for pathology. Okay, so DACI should be followed. Okay, what is DACI? First, dehydration should be done. Why? Because tissues contain a lot of water. So you have to remove the water. So that can be done only by alcohol. So we use alcohol and dehydrate the tissue. Now, what happens is now alcohol goes into the tissue. So we have to remove the alcohol from the tissue. So what do we do? We do clearing. So for clearing is done by clearing the uh, clearing is done by xylene okay so when we do uh, when we uh, do clearing with, with the xylene alcohol is removed okay so for removing alcohol now we do clearing with xylene now once the alcohol also has been removed now we have to put paraffin in that so we do impregnation so impregnation is done by paraffin okay so when we do paraffin it you remember uh, the temperature melting point of uh, paraffin is 56 to 58 degrees centigrade. So, we put impregnate the paraffin in it. Now, once we impregnate uh, the paraffin inside the tissue, now we have to embed it and make it in a block. That is a paraffin block. So, that is what is called as embedding. That is what is called as embedding. So, remember DACI, always the book name is DACI. So, we dehydrate, we clear, we impregnate and then we embed. Okay. So, that is the four sequence that we all have to remember. Okay, so remember this is the processing how we do. So we can't remember all these steps, no. So there is an automated processor. This is what is called tissue processor, and automatically it has jars in which the alcohol is always in the increasing concentration so that it can you know it can dehydrate the tissue. Okay, and after that we have xylenes which can remove the alcohol so it will clear the tissues. Okay, so that is how tissue processor works. Apart from that, what is this person doing? It is doing, he is making the blocks. Can you see he is making the blocks? And this technique is called embedding. What is this technique called? It is called embedding. Okay. So, remember that everybody. Okay. So, that is embedding and these are called as blocks. So, these are plastic cassettes. What are these called as? Plastic cassettes uh, in which the blocks are formed. <coughs> okay. So, that is your uh, technique, which is basically histopathology processing. Now, let's come to the molecular technique that they can ask you. Okay. So, here is the first question that came in the uh, previous year exam. So, in Sanger sequencing, why do you add DD NTPs? So, remember DD NTPs are dideoxy NTPs. So, it doesn't form the bond at 3 degree, uh, three dash, okay, 3 dash region, their bond, uh, we have to form a bond. But whenever we have dideoxy, 
so oh bond cannot be formed at 3o position and the uh, immediately immediately the dna polymerase will stop okay so basically whenever you use sanger sequencing you add dd uh, ntps because it stops the dna polymerase activity and it will immediately stop the processing so this is what happens okay so as soon as you put dd ntps what will happen is it will stop the polymerase and usually the dd ntps are put with a fluorescent tag so just like fish okay which have probes here we have primers which are fluorescently tagged uh, these are dd ntps so immediately it will stop at one sequence so we know exactly the sequence that where the uh, fluorescence is coming so like that we put every so we make a template and we tag every dnp with different colors like c is with blue g is with yellow a is with red t is with green so wherever we get that blue color we know that c is there wherever we get yellow color we know g is there so like that we can make whole sequence with the help of sanger sequencing okay so remember but you require that at least 15 to 20% abnormality should be there then only sanger sequencing can pick up the defect okay so the sensitivity of sanger sequencing is 15 to 20% that the sequence that's the sensitivity of sangers now let's look at this question what is the diagnostic method of choice when the tumor cells are heavily contaminated with the stromal cells in such conditions now we use next generation sequencing so next generation sequencing is basically done whenever the tissues are heavily contaminated then we do ngs then just even one small strand of the dna is enough for us to make a diagnosis okay what is qpcr it's a quantitative pcr okay suppose in cases of cml you identify that the transcript is p210 now you should always quantify it that how much it is there this is called real time pcr so you should quantitate that how many copies are there okay so that you can follow this patient or up over the time to see molecular response okay so that is what is qpcr okay so that is for quantification okay so what is digital pcr digital droplet pcr let's see this okay by the way guys earlier no uh, earlier we used to do pyro sequencing for this whenever the tumor cells were heavily contaminated we used to do pyro sequencing for it but now we do ngs okay now look at this which lab technique is used to identify mutated allele uh, in low frequency in the population so whenever the mutated allele is very in a very low frequency in a population then we use digital droplet pcr so what, what is digital droplet pcr in digital droplet pcr what what do we do is we use an oil immersion droplet technology so what happens is there are about 20000 droplets which are formed and pcr amplification is done in every droplet so even if the mutated allele is in a very low frequency we can quickly pick them up okay we can quickly pick them up okay so that's digital droplet pcr which is very very important to do uh, important uh, we can do that whenever the mutant allele is in a very low frequency okay so these are three techniques which should be very clear because we do them in lab regularly we do sangers we do uh, ngs we do digital droplet pcrs uh, and you have to know about fish also so these are some techniques which we do regularly so we should be knowing these okay now look at this another question that they ask you is in pregnancy which coagulation factor is decreased so guys you have to remember that the coagulation factor normally the coagulation factors are always increased in pregnancy it's a hypercoagulable state but factor 11 and protein c are reduced okay so factor 11 and protein c are always reduced okay whereas other coagulation proteins are increased remember factor 2 is unchanged factor 2 is unchanged please remember factor 12 is also called as hagman factor because its deficiency doesn't produce symptoms it doesn't produce bleeding in fact it produces thrombosis remember factor 13 is the factor with the longest half life and it is also called as lucky lorand factor okay so this factor produces cephalohematoma in bachas in children and it is also called as lucky lorand factor it has the longest half life factor 7 has the shortest half life okay so the half life is only 6 hours okay now, factor A deficiency is called as hemophilia A. Apart from that, von Willebrand factor is very important to carry factor 8. Apart from that, you should remember cryoprecipitate. Okay, cryoprecipitate contains factor 8. So, what is the composition of cryoprecipitate? Who will tell me? Cryoprecipitate contains factor 8, factor 13. It contains von Willebrand factor, fibrinogen and fibronectin. Okay, fibronogen and fibronectin. So, these are the compositions of cryoprecipitate 
which you should be very very clear with okay so that's the composition of cryo which everybody should be very very clear okay guys so once you're very very clear with this you should be uh, again knowing next thing uh is so who's going to tell me this hereditary leiomyomatosis and renal carcinoma syndrome is caused by mutation of fumarate hydratase genes guys so gene mutations are very very common so tfe gene is seen in xp11 renal cell carcinoma which is a mixture of clear cell and papillary and usually occurs in young vhl gene typically produces clear cell carcinoma of the kidney which is the most common cancer okay and it is by 3p mutation and bhd is basically bert hoch dupe it is typically seen in chromo 4 bar cc please remember chromo 4 bar cc has a perinuclear halo Okay, so which renal cell carcinoma has a perinuclear halo? So it is chromophobe RCC, which you should be clear with. And remember the stain that we use here is Hale's colloidal blue or Hale's colloidal iron. That is the stain we use for chromophobe RCC. Remember, this is oncometabolism uh, when we talk about enzyme mutations. Okay, so fumarate hydratase is basically seen in papillary carcinoma of kidney that you have to remember and it is with hereditary leiomyomatosis. Please remember everybody, uh, uh, if somebody is asking which tumors show you perinuclear halos, remember chromophobe RCC is in the kidney and oligodendrogliomas in the brain are the two tumors which typically show you perinuclear halos. You should always remember them. Okay. Right. Perfect. Sattvik is saying it chromophobe shows you extensive chromosome losses. Yes. Extensive chromosome losses is seen in chromophobe. And what is the mutation of papillary carcinoma of kidney? So it show, So it can have be familial or it can be sporadic, okay? So if it is familial, it shows you trisomy 7, okay? It shows you trisomy 7, which has met protoncogene. Whereas if it is sporadic, it can also have trisomy 7, but most commonly it has loss of chromosome Y and trisomy of 7 can be there and trisomy of 17 can also be there, okay? So that is very typical of papillary carcinoma of kidney, okay? So these are the important things you should remember, okay? Met very good uh, next pg trivia perfect it is met which is familial papillary carcinomas which you should be remembering okay now everybody should remember this chart from the robins which can be asked which is the diseases which are associated with tau remember alzheimer's disease frontotemporal dementia Parkinson's with LRR K, uh, K2 mutations is typically associated with tau. Alpha synuclein is seen in Parkinson's in multisystem atrophy. And remember, polyglutamine aggregates are seen in Huntington's disease, where you have a lot of CAG, 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 which is accumulating. Now, along with that, spinocerebellar ataxia also shows you CAG accumulations. Okay, so that should be very, very clear. So, but A beta is only deposited in Alzheimer's, okay, which you should be very, very clear with this, okay. TPD 43, you have to remember frontotemporal dementia and amylotrophic lateral sclerosis and FUS, basically again, frontotemporal dementia and amylotrophic lateral dystrophy, okay. So, that is one chart which you should remember for neurodegenerations. Okay, also remember in cases of rheumatic heart disease, the characteristic feature is Ashoff nodule. And a shaft nodule typically occurs around the blood vessels and it is made up of NHCO cells, which shows you caterpillar chromatin. So NHCO cells are nothing but, NHCO cells are nothing but, they are modified macrophages, you have to remember, uh, of the heart. And they're seen in rheumatic heart disease. And remember, when they fuse together, they can form giant cells and they will, there will be lymphocytes, which also will be collected here. So these are your Ashoff nodules, which should be clear. Okay, so in heart, you should remember rheumatic heart disease, Ashoff nodule is very characteristic. Apart from that, caterpillar chromatin is very typical of NHCO cells. Also, you should also remember that granulation tissue in MI is always formed on day 7. That's a very characteristic point you remember. Apart from that, you remember the first morphological change to be seen in MI is, is waviness. Okay, so waviness. Uh, is a very characteristic earliest morphological changes that is seen in myocardial infarction. Okay, apart from that, you remember that we have a stain called TTC stain. Okay, so uh, uh, so TTC stain basically uh, goes and binds with LDH. Okay, so whenever we have myocardial infarction, LDH leaks out. So TTC will give you pale color, whereas viable tissues will give you uh, magenta pink or red color okay so magenta pink color is basically the color it depends upon this 
stain uh, the type of stain that you're using okay so magenta pink color is can be seen with uh, dtc stain whenever the heart tissue is viable okay always remember the order of draw guys this is one of the question which everybody should remember and i always say after culture you should remember you should always take citrate why the order of draw should be followed to avoid the contamination so after 2 cc you should remember the she and then sugar okay she is sugar okay cc okay cc she sugar okay so serum please remember what is the difference between the red color vial and the golden color vial so red color vial has a clot activator but does not have gel separator whereas the golden color vial have the gel separator so what happens is the clotting is faster and hemolysis is less okay so that's the difference between red color vial and the golden color vial citrate tube has 3.2 percent trisodium citrate remember if we say 3.8 percent trisodium citrate it is used for esr and then we have black color vacuum trainer for that okay so then we will have black color vacuum trainer for that also remember the best anticoagulant for cbc ps and for reticulocyte count is edta and for pcr we always use edta so fish should never be used um, um a fish um for fish, we should not use EDTA, okay? So, for fish, we should use heparin. So, if you want to do fish or you want to do cytogenetics, you should take the sample in heparin. So, heparin should be used whenever you have to do fish and cytogenetics. Whereas, for PCR, you should never use heparin. For PCR, you should always use EDTA, okay? What is the best anticoagulant for flow cytometry? Flow cytometry, you can either use heparin or EDTA. Both are good, but which is better? EDTA is better okay so what is the use of heparin in flow cytometry the viability of the antigen lasts for about 48 hours in uh, heparin and 24 hours in edta but still antigens are well preserved in edta so we prefer edta okay and gray is always for sugar it is sodium fluoride it is for sugar so these are some points that you should always remember in order of draw Please remember the catch images, the spot images. These are your fetal glomerulus like structure. There's a blood vessel and the tumor cells around it and there is a big cavity. This is Schiller dual body, okay, which is seen in York sac tumor. So this is Schiller dual body, okay. Now remember this. Uh, these are your pink color material with the blue cells around them. These are Homer right rosettes, so which, which can be seen in neuroblastoma, medulloblastomas, okay. These are follicle-like structure and all cells show you your coffee bean nucleus. So this is your granulosa cell tumor. Please remember granulosa cell tumor typically has a mutation of FOXL2. It's a very girly tumor. It secretes a lot of estrogen and it sends first metastasis to the contralateral ovary. And remember the marker that we use here is in heaven. Okay. And this is your leomyomas, which you should always remember. Okay, so leomyomas, which has spindle-shaped cells, which are arranged like this. Okay, so these are spot images that you should always, always, always remember. Okay, and that is that was the end of the session, guys. I hope you have understood something. And if you loved it, do send your feedbacks. Okay, so you can send the feedback at my Instagram. That my Instagram channel is Dr. Vandana Pathite. And, and if you like it, do follow me on Dr. Vandana Pathology. I have a Facebook uh, uh, group also, which is Dr. Vandana Pathology Study Circle. Okay, YouTube, you are already seeing this channel on the YouTube and Telegram is also my name that is Dr. Vandana Pathology. Okay, so that is about it. Do let me know your feedbacks guys and all the very best for your exam and uh, the one of the most important thing, just before the exam, do, 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 check for my Jinx question. Okay, so I am happy to tell you that this time in INICT super speciality, uh, it exam i have got i predicted six question out of that three came in the exam so i'm super happy about it so i just hope that something like that occurs in your inict also and i'm able to predict some questions i do not know uh but uh, uh hope so uh, some of the questions come in exam and i could be helpful to you guys okay so all the very best guys and i'm so sorry i was not able to sh share my uh, screen i don't know what was the issue but there was some issue okay so 
all the very very best to all of you and for any doubts feel free to contact me uh, i respond best on my instagram that is dr vanna pathology and i have my whatsapp group also uh, whatsapp group also uh, one of which is full and second of which has some uh, some uh, space so if you want to join uh, do let me know on my instagram i will be happy to send link to you right guys <laughs> oh thank you uh, thank you uh, gk yes so yes i have a travel channel also which is very naive which is very very initial in it is initial pages uh, i like to explore that um, so that is called uh, new girl wonders so for that for those who are travel enthusiast can follow me in that though it has very few travel stories for now but i'm sure uh, i i will be able to post more when i travel more thank you next pg trivia you follow my travel page thank you thank you so much asman hai aage i love your name your name is very good and uh, uh i will always be ina ct is uh, one of my forte i love preparing for this exam since years it's it's one thing which i love right oh my god it, it is very naive that in my travel page is very naive uh, ajit it's it's it has very few followers for now it's only 187 i am just hiding it <laughs> because i'm not traveling much for now i am a little busy but uh, definitely i would love to travel more and i would like to post more uh, in the coming uh, months probably and i hope uh, and one of my one request to all of you guys please 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 do send me questions of your iict do let me know if i have been proven useful uh, whether my quiz questions or my uh, my um jinx questions or my uh, you know discussions have been proven useful to you uh, if yes do let me know your uh, uh, your feedbacks and your questions please post questions uh let me know questions so that i can prepare better and i can you know help your juniors in a better way yes next pg trivia this is the last slide for you okay so that was uh, by the way uh, how many of you were able to identify the first slide that i had posted in the group all the images in the first slide how many of you were able to identify that okay let me let me show you the first slide hmm so how many of you were able to identify all the images in this slide so quickly can you tell me what is this <clears throat> the first one this is what the first slide here what is it showing stellate granuloma perfect guys yes so what is this this is your stellate granuloma right guys so what is this reticulin showing you uh, circling like this this is called hooping this is seen in primary cns lymphoma what is this very good this is azopardi effect which you see in small cell carcinoma these are mass in bodies okay so these are mass in bodies okay what is this this is bronchiectasis okay dilated channels in the end what is this asbestos bodies what is this homa right rosettes okay so these were uh, these are the all images that were there and these images i had given you given you in the quiz so i didn't repeated these images okay remember cal retinin is a stain for mesothelioma okay so that is the end of the images okay perfect okay guys so with that we'll finish up the session okay good night and uh, happy reading everybody bye bye